So once again, how are you doing? Are you hanging in there? Are you settling into some new routines? Are you finding some sort of semblance of balance as you do your part to literally save lives just by staying at home? In the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, John tells his version of a story told in all of the Gospels of Jesus healing the blind man. But in John, there are some very intriguing differences. I want you to listen now to the Word of God as it comes to us in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, as told by Eugene Peterson's The Message. Listen carefully. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? And Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause-effect relationship here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun still shines. When night falls, the workday is over. For as long as I am in the world, there is plenty of light. I am the world's light. He said this, and then he spit in the dust, made a clay paste with his saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes, and said, Go wash at the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. The man went and washed, and he saw. Soon the town was buzzing. His relatives and those who year after year had seen him as a blind man begging were saying, why, isn't this the man that we knew who sat here and begged? Others said, it's him all right. But others objected, it can't be the same man at all. It just looks like him. And he said, it's me, the very one. And they said, how did you get your eyes open? Well, a man named Jesus made a paste and rubbed it on my eyes and told me to go to Siloam and wash. And I did what he said. And when I washed, I saw. So where is he now? I don't know. And it goes on like this. For the next 30 verses, we see all of these people just a buzz. It feels like a Monty Python skit because they're all asking these very different, disconnected questions that just show that they're pretty much clueless. And so they're running around, and then finally they come to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees kind of hear what Jesus is saying about blindness and asking the wrong questions. And all of a sudden, one of the Pharisees says, wait a second, Jesus. Surely you're not saying that we are blind. It's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, here in this version of this story, we see all of these peripheral characters. In the other Gospels, the center focus of this story is the miracle. But here, it's just the very tip of the iceberg. The real story is about all of the peripheral characters and the questions that they're asking and the things that they're saying and the ways that they're just not getting it. Which I think is fascinating because it's so like us, isn't it, to ask the wrong questions? Who is to blame for this anyway? Is it, is it those secrety, secret Chinese who didn't tell us for too long or our own government for waiting too long to act? What's happened to all of our testing kits and ventilators? Why don't we have a federal response or a federal supply chain? And those kids on spring break, what were they thinking anyway? The blame question is as unhelpful today for us as it was for them back then. What is helpful is for us to reframe this question as Jesus did, to ask ourselves, what is God doing here? What is God trying to teach us or show us about our lives and about our world? What is God trying to do inside of me and trying to do for the world? And how can I join in and become a part of it? We've been spending the last two weeks trying to reach out to a lot of people, asking them the question, how are you doing? Through telephone calls and Zoom calls and for the most part, in the first two weeks, we were getting a lot of stiff upper lips. 
a lot of people are saying, hey, I'm doing fine, we're good, we're here hunkered down at home, we're trying to get some stuff done, we're making the most of our hours and our days. But I would say that over the last couple of days, I think more and more we're hearing people are saying, I am not doing great. This is hard. This is harder than I expected it to be. I am not made to do this isolation thing. I'm worried and I'm scared. I feel confused and really sad. Maybe you haven't even known anyone yet who has this personally, and yet there still is a lot of loss. When C.S. Lewis was talking about the loss of his wife, he said, I never realized how much grief feels like fear. There is that same fluttering of butterflies in my stomach, that same constant restlessness. I keep on yawning. I'm constantly swallowing. I think it's so important for us tonight, for us to tell you that whatever you are experiencing, whatever feelings you're feeling, it's okay. Go ahead and allow yourself to feel those feelings, to to identify them and to try to figure out what's going on inside. A part of the Lenten experience is to move inward and to take a look at what it is that we are feeling. Part of this 40-day experience, this that we call Lent, the 40-year experience that the Israelites went through is us realizing that there are things that are 10 times more dangerous than a virus. Lent gives us an opportunity to open our lives for introspection, to take inventory, and to allow God to heal us from things that are much more deadly. Things like our hatred and fear and prejudice. Things like our greed and our streak of fierce independence. We can allow God to heal us of our resentment and our envy and our anger, of our sense of inadequacy and shame and guilt. And when your mind begins racing with questions of how much longer is this going to take? When can I get back to my old routines? How much further is my portfolio going to sink? Am I going to get sick? Is someone I love going to get sick? Am I going to go mad being cooped up in here? Remember to reorientate yourself around the question that Jesus is asking. God, what's going on here? What is it that you're trying to teach me? What is it that you are trying to do in my life and in our world? And how can I join in it and become a part of it? We love you and are thinking about you and praying for you all the time. Reach out to us if there's anything that you need. God bless you. Amen. Hello, friends. As we maintain our stay-at-home orders, I am reflecting on the fact that we are still in this season of Lent. There have been lots of jokes about how days feel like weeks and the weeks feel like years. And this is one of the longest Lents I think many of us have lived through. And it's not over yet, my friends. We are towards the end. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Easter is coming, and yet we still have Palm Sunday and Monday Thursday and Good Friday before we encounter the resurrection of Easter. And so I'm here still in my home. I have my candles lit, and I've been reflecting on this Lenten season and this period of time spent in the wilderness. It's amazing how 
We can feel so isolated in such a big city. And in fact, even not in quarantine times, I've often heard this, that many people feel very lonely even in the midst of big crowds or even living in huge cities. And that especially might be true for some of us in this city now, that even as we live in the midst of millions of people, that we are isolated and we are quarantined and we are alone. And that makes me think about Jesus in the wilderness when Jesus was baptized and then he immediately went out into the wilderness to pray for 40 days. And thinking about the time that God spent in the wilderness that Jesus, the Son of God, that Jesus, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, spent in the wilderness, is incredibly powerful. Wilderness is a very common motif in Scripture. It's throughout the Hebrew Bible, and it plays us into Jesus going into the wilderness. We see wilderness with Hagar and with Joseph and with the prophet Elijah, and of course with the Hebrew people wandering through the desert. And so Jesus going into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 days, mirrors the Hebrew people being in the desert for 40 years. I came across this passage in this book I was reading. This is a book I've been reading with my small group. It's called Inspired, and it's by Rachel Held Evans. And I definitely recommend it. I've enjoyed it immensely. She has a chapter about deliverance stories and a section in that about wilderness. Since so much deliverance does come out of dry places, wilderness places, these places where we feel as if there is nothing there. And yet, out of that, God draws life. God gives us sustenance to keep going. So listen to Rachel Held Evans' words about wilderness. She says, The wilderness, by design, disorients. As any wilderness trekker, past or present, will tell you, the wilderness has a way of forcing the point of bringing to the surface whatever fears, questions, and struggles hide within. Nothing strips you down to your essential humanity and inherent dependency quite like submitting to the elements, surrendering to the wild. In the wilderness, you find out what you are made of and who your friends are. You are forced to leave behind all non-essentials, to quiet yourself, and listen. Friends, there is so much about that paragraph that I resonate with for this time, for this place, for these days of stay at home and quarantine, for these days of uncertainty and disorientation, of not knowing, and yet it is that invitation to listen, to listen for the Spirit of God moving in your life, to listen for those words of hope and affirmation, to listen to how God is at work in your life through your friends, through your family, through even unexpected ways to hear the way that God is speaking to you, is calling you forth out of the wilderness, out of a dry place, out of a place of disorientation, into a place of abundance and calm, of peace and of rest. Friends, may we hear God in these days, knowing that the wilderness is not forever, knowing that God has been in the wilderness and will draw us out, that God is here with us forever and ever.
Amen.